to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger and Brian Brew, and today we're talking about Israel's theocratic republic. We've talked a little bit about the justice system in the Old Testament, so we'll now put that in the larger context of how the government was supposed to function in Israel. That word theocratic, why are we going to use that word, Greg? Well, its original meaning is the rule of God, which is kind of what Israel had. In fact, in any kind of civil sense, Israel is the only nation that's ever been a theocracy. Mm -hmm. Now, on another level, the church is a theocracy. In fact, the whole universe is a theocracy, and I assume we'll get to that in time. But as you look back over um, the history of the world, we actually see lots of civilization, societies, city-states, that claim to be manifestations of the rule of God on earth. This was, this was standard in uh, the Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia, and in the Greek city-states in Rome, in Egypt. We, as Christians, discount those simply because they were lying. They weren't in <laughs> touch with God. They were in touch <laughs> right. with demons. But, you know, they did claim to be theocracies. And, and the difference was that in Israel, uh, except for the brief time when Moses was alive, uh, there was no one person designated the spokesman for God who had a, an immediate and direct pipeline to God who could at any point say, well, no, because God says, except insofar as they referred to the written word of God. Israel was governed by written laws that came from God. And God manifested his glory in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. But God, after Moses' death, God was not really in the habit of very often talking. He said what he needed to say for the time. And though he would reveal himself with regard to specific incidents and, and needs through his prophets, the, the civil government of Israel did not have a divine spokesman. They didn't have a divine Pharaoh on the throne or a divine Caesar. They did not have a city-state whose institution spoke for God. They did not have an oracle they could consult on every little detail or just because they were curious. They set the pattern for the Western world of government, a civil government, ruled by written laws, uh, run by ordinary men who had no claim to inspiration or let alone divinity. They were judges. It was Bob down the street and Sam on the next block and Ed over there, you know, a few neighborhoods over. These were the or more likely Malachi and Zebulun and, you know, whatever the Hebrew equivalents would be. But they were just these guys, you know. Godly men, honest, was the standard. But they weren't, in the pagan sense, full of God. In the Christian sense, they were spirit-filled in that they were supposed to be born again. Men who feared God, had the fear of God in them, and who were honest, reflected the work of God's spirit in their hearts. But none of this continuity of being nonsense whereby God manifested himself in them in a way he did not in other believers. Administratively, they were simply the guys who had some experience and wisdom and honesty and were asked to help settle some things in terms of a written law that everybody was supposed to know. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't, well, there was a problem. <laughs> and, so question. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned a moment ago that this, this uh, rule by the written word set the example for the West. A lot of people will pin that on the Code of Hammurabi rather than the law that Moses transcribed. Do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, oh, they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is why timelines and chronology are so terribly important in a study of history. The, uh, the secular timeline that we're familiar with makes Egypt's history a whole lot longer than it should be and ties all the histories of the of the Middle East to it, and so pushes him Hammurabi and his work further and further and further back before the time of Moses. And so people can come to the the Code of Hammurabi and say, "Ooh, look at this! This sounds like some things that Moses would later write." <laughs> but when we reconstruct the chronology of the ancient world based on Scripture, it turns out that Hammurabi came after Moses. So there likely is a connection, and it, and it might bypass Moses. Some of these things that Moses wrote or that God gave him at Sinai may, be, may have been well known before then. Not everything that God said to his people or said to the patriarchs got written in Scripture immediately. We, we regularly run into things like the tithe or the uncleanness laws. 
or the uh, lamb or goes the lamb back to Abel. Yeah, things that are just mentioned in passing as if, well, everybody knows this. And yet we don't know when or how God originally told them. So there, there may be a huge background of, of material that the angel world knew and treated as they would. Or it may be that Moses was a lot better known than the world, the pagan world wanted to admit, and that Hammurabi had in fact read Moses. Because some of the similarities are pretty strong, and some of them are horribly not even remotely close. <laughs> um, What's who, the phrase, if an ox gores someone in the street, there is no remedy? Yeah. <laughs> I think there is a remedy for that. <laughs> yeah, the Mosaic Law certainly had a remedy. Uh, and, and, and that's that's worth mentioning, all, all of this, um, because what we're, we're looking at here is the old question, by what standard? If you want to have a civil government, by what standard is it going to rule? Are we going to appeal to tradition, to the voice of the gods, to the voice of our fathers, to... Uh, the latest studies and surveys to our hearts, to our consciences. What is the standard that a civil government should adopt? And why? And once we've picked that standard, why did we? And why did we let them? And there's a lot of whys going on here uh, that both the world and the church have sort of done a hocus pocus with and said, well, it's just obvious moving on now. <laughs> well, it's... It, the obvious thing is that if God has not spoken, nothing's obvious. If God will not tell us the nature of right and wrong, then we got a real problem. And it's a civil issue, but it's also, of course, a personal one, and a, a salvation issue. How do I know I need to be saved if I don't know right and wrong? How does a, a senator, a judge, making or judging in terms of the law, know that what he's doing is right if God hasn't, at least at some point in the background, set the standard from which other judges and legislatures have made application. If if all we can say is, well, that's the way we've always done it, it's not terribly helpful. Uh, we, can, we can try to live with that, but the history of the West has shown it doesn't work very well. Sooner or later, we get tired of that, and we want something that we think is more efficient, more trendy, more what's happening now, more loving. Yeah, but constant cultural change keeps producing constant legal change. And we no longer know what our courts should be doing, except they're probably doing wrong and evil things now. They need to be they need to be more hip like I am. Oh, I can't even say hip anymore. That's like sixties. <laughs> need to be more up to date. Up to date. Progressive. Progressive. There's progressive. a good that's word. That's the word. That's, that's the yeah. word. We need to be more progressive. The question, of course, then immediately is, why is progressive better than regressive? Mm -hmm. Why is evolution better than de-evolution or devolution? Devolution. Why, why is going forward better than going backward? Why is change better than conservation of the old ways? I remember a line from G.K. Chesterton where an atheist had written to him and said, I don't think there's good and evil. I think it's all just part of the upward motion of the earth or upward uh, progression of the universe. And he said, well, if there's no difference between good and evil, why should there be a difference between up and down? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How do you measure this change? How is, why is it, and in what sense is it better today than it was yesterday or than it was a few hundred years ago? We, we, we keep holding on to elements of what was before. We borrow last year's capital and use it as a foundation for our revolutions Never asking, wait a minute, if we throw away all the found, if the foundations be destroyed, mm. then Can the how, do? yeah, what, what will the righteous do? How do we move forward? How do we know that forward is, what is forward and why is forward better? And, and why do we care about moving forward anyhow? And why should I love you? And why should you love me if there is not an absolute standard? I was, there, there's an old book um, that discusses the history of Illuminati. Yes. <laughs> I'm doing some stuff with conspiracy theory right now for my, for my novel. And I was just looking for quotes. And I was surprised. This is um, John Robinson's um, Proofs of a Conspiracy. I've had it for ages. I've never read it. But as I was looking through, the, the man is is still somewhat humanistic in his thinking and moralistic. and But, but he does get to the point uh, of saying in the end, these people, these conspirators, these sophists, these philosophers, 
the sons of the French Revolution, um, they keep talking about better, but by what standard are they measuring <laughs> better? It seems to me that all they want is to have their own less satisfied. Why is that better? Or why is it worse for that matter if there is no God, which is their first point of departure? If there's no God, so we can do better. Well, really, if there's no God, what, what do you mean better? Anyway, we're kind of out here. <laughs> Let's walk back. <laughs> walk it back. And talk a little bit about the nature of the theocracy. And to keep myself on track, I'm going to read a little bit and then we can talk about whatever you like. Uh, looking at Israel, Israel was a confederation of 12 tribes that were united religiously by their covenant with Yahweh. And by religion, I mean not simply the externals of worship, but I mean basic commitment of life, their worldview, their ultimate commitments. Um, liturgically, formal worship, by their system of worship centered on the tabernacle, politically by their court systems and laws. Her civil magistrates were chosen by the people. God didn't prescribe the means of election. The magistrates were to be able, honest men who knew God's law. Scripture does give us one example of a woman serving as a judge, a high court judge at that, Deborah. The magistrates were to enforce God's civil laws and lead by moral example. Uh, Israel's judicial system consisted of graduated courts serving families of 10, 50, 100, and 1,000. In our terms, this would be something like a, a judge for each neighborhood, for each larger collection of neighborhoods for each quarter of a town or for each town or city. Judges could remand difficult cases to the superior courts, and probably appeals by contending parties were possible as well. And at the top of the judicial pyramid was a single judge who dealt only with the most difficult cases, originally Moses, later Joshua, then the judges we encounter in the book that has that name. The high, uh, the high judge was usually also a military commander for the nation, although not always. And I'll stop there. Well, except to throw this out. And Israel had no standing legislature. They had the Ten Commandments and the case laws. So uh, I, I think the, the of the many possible main points here, at least one of them is it, it would be kind of hard to look at Israel and say, this is a nation mm -hmm. by any of our modern standards of nationhood. Even in a war, the, the military commanders could say, come and fight with us. And if um, several tribes said, yeah, no, we're sitting this one out. That kind of was that. God could step in and settle it, but normally that was just, okay, well, you didn't help out God's people. We didn't think we were required. We were too far away. We didn't trust your leadership. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. We'll see what God says about that, but that that was it. There was, We're not told that the civil government was how how it was provided for in terms of a taxation system. Uh, later on, we are told that any tax that exceeded 10%, the Lord's tithe, was obviously tyrannical. But we're not told how these local judges were paid. Maybe they just got, um, you know, into the year gifts or stipends or something. There's so much here that we're not told. So it's nothing like a complete plan for civil government. It is a broad outline. It sets some some general ideas. So possibly a second main point, no standing legislature. You don't, you know, when, when our country was founded, we were concerned about a standing army with good reason. <laughs> yeah. Far more dangerous in many ways is the standing legislature, because what does the legislature do? Come up with new laws. New laws, as long as they're in session, every time they're in session, because that's what we pay them for, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My pet peeve about the legislature, it's not my only pet peeve, but it's a big one, mm. is that they all live in D.C. Mm. It's like, you should have to live in the state that you're representing that's going to be affected by what yeah. you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Israel just display didn't have one. They, they had a Senate of elders who could, on special occasions, I assume, make up specific laws about specific things. Uh, and the elders of a city presumably could set things, make laws like we close the gates at 7 p.m. Uh, <laughs> we need to refurbish the communal well. Um, so we need, you know, a buck from everybody in the city. We're, again, we're not told specifically, but the, the responsibilities that the Old Testament lays upon the civil government were exceedingly slight. The only real 
exception being during war, and there was no provision for any kind of war of aggression. Wars were to be defensive. Now, sometimes the defensive war might lead the army outside the boundaries of Israel. They were attacked and they had to retaliate. But even then, there was no provision for a universal draft. The leaders could have the moral authority to say, we're under attack. God's people are under attack. You need to come and help us. But then there were also some very explicit exceptions. Mm -hmm. you're, you're married and haven't taken a wife. You're excused. You planted a vineyard and haven't eaten the fruit. You're excused. You've, you've built a house and haven't dedicated it. You're excused. You're simply afraid. You may go home. And since the uh, the war had to be sanctioned by the priesthood, then in theory, conscientious, conscientious objection was a thing. Uh, we believe this is an immoral war, so we're leaving, or we're not coming. We're not even going to show up. Where are the priests to sanction this? Where's where's the priestly voice here? Yeah, you're calling those guys priests? They and their golden calves? Maybe not. <laughs> and, and so this is. Uh, one author has, has written that this is the closest thing to libertarian sort of government the world has ever seen. <laughs> An awful lot depended upon self-government, <laughs> upon the, uh, the ability of people to rule themselves in terms of a law that was universally recognized, or at least supposed to be universally recognized. So and Brian's it, looking gleeful for our listeners' yeah, and benefit. Yeah, and, <laughs> and rightly so. I mean, we, we, sometimes we, we can use the word libertarian in a, in a lot of senses, and here's a good one. Uh, where you say, you know, there's, there's a government here, but it's very thin and light, and it has little to do. Um, it, it, it punishes bad guys when they are convicted of, of criminal acts upon the testimony of two or three witnesses to an overt act in open court, and there is a possibility of appeal. Short of that, the leaders mostly lead by example and by reminding people that, hey, that's rude. Stop that. <laughs> don't, don't, don't harass the widow. We might have to call you before the elders. You know, that kind of thing. More or less the way the church elders today do their job. Not by constantly staring in people's windows or eavesdropping or bugging their, uh, their homes, but simply engaging in instruction and example. And in cases of clear, overt actions that violate a public civil law, then and only then uh, intervening with the required amount of evidence. Circumstantial evidence did count. We see a couple examples where circumstantial evidence uh, does substitute for direct you know, eyewitness testimony. I've heard this paraphrased as two or three lines of independent testimony. Is that that fair seem enough? to be? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I have uh, two friends. Both of them were DAs in their time. One of them now is. Uh, uh, appeals court judge. And I asked them once upon a time when they were still lawyers, what, what do you think of um, of um, circumstantial evidence as opposed to eyewitness evidence? They both said, oh, we'd rather try a case on circumstantial evidence any day. Hmm. Because people forget, they change their mind, their stories evolve, they elaborate. The evidence is what the evidence is. Uh, and, and people sometimes don't understand the, the, the nature of circumstantial evidence. For instance, if you are on some remote mountaintop outside a cabin coming to visit your friend, you hear a gunshot from within, you come to the door, it's locked, as are the windows, you break down the door, and there you see a man lying dead and his wife standing over him with a gun in the hand, still smoking, what you have is circumstantial evidence. That's not eyewitness testimony because you didn't see her pull the trigger. You have well, it's the top of the mountain. There's no one else here. There was no one else, no other way in or out. We heard the gun go off. She's still holding. It's still circumstantial. That is, the circumstances compel a reasonable conclusion. And there are two instances of this in Scripture where this shows up. One, and they both involve um, confession. In um, Joshua, when Achan confesses to having mm -hmm. stolen from the ruins of Jericho, the result was that Israel lost the battle in Ai. Right. Mo, uh, Joshua hears his testimony, hears his confession, but still sends men off to his tent to collect the circumstantial evidence, which is to say the loot he took from Jericho hidden under his tent. The two together, the, the personal testimony and the evidence are required. Uh, a lot of people 
confess to things they never did. Mm -hmm. And so even with a confession, you need the other. Similar case in the days of David, he's he has been on the run from Saul, but Saul is killed on the battlefield. And a young man in Malachite shows up in David's mm -hmm. camp and says, I killed Saul. Well, I mean, it was a mercy killing. The Philistines had already shot him. He was suffering. He was in pain. He was dying. He asked me to do it. You know, all the things that we use for mercy killing these days. And so knowing that he was your enemy, he couldn't live, he wanted to die, he was going to mistreat if I didn't intervene, I stood on him and killed him. And here's the evidence. And he presents the trophies from Saul's body. And David says, huh, really? Kill him. <laughs> uh, uh, how were you not afraid to stretch forth your hand against the Lord's anointed? Speaking uh, of the, confessing to things you haven't done, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and David's own response seems to suggest that he didn't believe him because he says, your, your blood be upon your own head because you have testified saying I've killed the Lord's anointed. David probably was smart enough to realize this guy didn't have the guts to do that sort of thing. But testimony, evidence. He wanted to be blamed for it. Okay. He just didn't think that was the blame he was going to get. Mm. Yeah. I mean, uh, even even back to the other the other case where they, they go to his tent and, and find the, the loot that he had uh, taken. We can look at the other case law regarding man stealing, where it's mm -hmm. not just the person who sold him, but the one who is found in possession of him that shall be put to death. Yeah. So yeah. possession is also <laughs> something worth uh, punishing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> if you can be shown that you knew that you shouldn't be doing this. Uh, on the other hand, and I think this, uh, there, there's a line here that people will still find offensive, but I think it's further to the right than, than most people would acknowledge or understand. Uh, you could live in Israel and be pagan. Mm -hmm. There was nothing that compelled you to enter into covenant with Yahweh, to become circumcised. You could not work on the Sabbath day, but you didn't have to go to synagogue or whatever the equivalent might have been in those days. You were not allowed to worship idols, which was normally an outside, out of doors, public act, or sacrifice, which was definitely an outside <laughs> of doors, public act. A little bit messy, that one. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, those those were the main two things. I mean, there's also uh, the rule against witchcraft, but witchcraft in those days usually meant using potions or poisons to kill people, mm -hmm. which would, it's still I illegal today. <laughs> Um, cool motives, so, still murder. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Uh, the, the exact the exact mechanism isn't, isn't terribly important. Uh, but beyond this, there was no attempt by God's law, no one was ever authorized, no magistrate was ever authorized, to pry into people's personal beliefs. Well, you you left Phoenicia, but did you? are you harboring in your heart a love for Baal? You are? We must kill you now. No, that didn't happen. Now, some people have misread this as, well, that means you had permission to practice your idolatry in private. No, you didn't have permission. You just probably could get away with it, which is not at all the same thing. Yeah. Saying that uh, the government doesn't <laughs> have the right to come snooping around is not the same thing as saying you have the right to do something wrong. Exactly. But there's there was no provision, as I said earlier, there's no provision for bugging, eavesdropping, wiretapping, or whatever the equivalent would have been in that culture, given given the limits of their technology. There's also it, almost a, a proto-Fourth Amendment there, mm -hmm. where you your place of residence is secure from yeah. random seizure and search. Yeah. In well, fact, that's the uh, Second Amendment, too. <laughs> yeah. In the um, last week, uh, we saw that, I think it was last week, that if you got in debt to somebody and um, you had to give them up a pledge that they would collect every day and then return every night, uh, they come to collect the pledge. They can't just march in and say, hey, give it to me. I'm on a schedule here. You're late. They had to wait until you brought it out to them, no matter, despite the fact that they had a legal claim on that pledge, they could not enter your home. So, yeah, we uh, it, it'd be fun to write a paper, a little book on the biblical precedents for our Ten Amendments. And so I think you could do a pretty good job of proving all of them in some measure or in complete measure are a reflection of biblical law. 
Now, the Bible doesn't particularly use the language of rights, and there, there's a slight danger, maybe sometimes a big danger, with using that language. The Bible prefers words like liberty and law, permission and authority. Mm -hmm. what, what does the state have the authority to do? Uh, and there's an awful lot a plane didn't have the authority to do in Israel, even though the magistrates work for God. They couldn't go barging into a house and saying, we have heard rumors that you have idols here. We will now look about for them. No, that's that was completely illegal. Uh, and the same. And there are some of the other things that generally people didn't do in open, like adultery or homosexual acts or bestiality. There was no permission in Israel to do these things. Absolutely not. But neither was there a permission for the state to go looking in windows to see if they could find evidence mm -hmm. of these things. The accusation was to be brought by witnesses to the act, uh, whether it was homosexuality or witchcraft. The fact that someone stood up in the, in the town square and said, I'm a homosexual, I'm a witch, legally was irrelevant. That's, a, that's an interesting claim, and you might get in trouble for inciting a riot, I don't know, or just being rude, but it's not, <laughs> it's not a criminal offense as such. And, and you can say that all you want. A lot of people say a lot of things to get attention or to stir up trouble or even to get themselves killed sometimes. But if there's not, and generally, and again, your testimony by itself, hey, I just uh, spent three hours worshiping Satan. You got, you, you, you got it on camera. You got a witness <laughs> or two, something. Uh, no, I forgot to get a witness. Then get out of here. We don't need to hear this. I mean, I'm so yeah, glad you brought this up because I have been <laughs> waiting to use a Satan worship meme for weeks <laughs> and weeks. So teaser okay. for the memes I for this week. I cannot even imagine what a Satan worshiping meme might look like, but I'm, I'm afraid forward to this. <laughs> <laughs> so again, we're seeing the, the severe limitations that the Bible puts on civil government. The Bible does not trust civil government a great deal. Mm -mm. Uh, and in, in establishing it as, uh, as an institution with the sword directed against lawbreakers and foreign invaders, it, it also gives it a very small job list, very small job description of what it can do and what it can do, and does not provide a great source of revenue for it to do much else, even if it could, in theory, get away with it. Now, when um, Israel asks for a king, Samuel's first warning is, He's going to up the income stream left and right. He's going to tax you more than 10%. He's going to do, um, oh, I just went blank, uh, imminent He's domain gonna draft. laws. Yeah. He's going to, yeah, military draft, industrial draft. He's going to do all this stuff. Not because it is the nature of kingship as such, but because of the way you want a king. You want a king in place of God. Well, you want a king in place of a God. Guess what? He's going to act like a God. If you just wanted a chief executive officer that you want, and you wanted a, a dynasty of something, God actually promised that. God had <laughs> yeah, told. That is God what he had, promised. <laughs> yeah, God had told uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that kings would come out of their loins. And the law had provided for the existence of a king. And he gave very specific things, like he's got to be one of the covenant people. He can't multiply to himself gold, offensive weapons, horses, uh, or multiple tr foreign national treaties, many wives. And he has to be literate because he has to be able to read the word of God and write it out and then read in it, presumptively to act upon it all the days of his life. A very ordinary kind of king. And even when Samuel and God consent to the whole thing with Saul, they still write a covenant document to place that kingship under law. It's a, it's a what's the word, covenantal? Constitutional. Constitutional monarchy, Yeah. You know. So God doesn't exactly stamp and say, here is the only kind of civil format you may have. But he draws kind of a broad circle that says, okay, that's those, th there's the circle, make something work. He doesn't specify how elections are to happen. Presumably somebody voted, but you know what? The Bible never mentions voting, period. Probably patriarchs, heads of families, but we're not told. Because obviously, those are minor details compared with mm -hmm. the basic reality of people knowing and honoring the law of God from their hearts. Mm -hmm. When you have that, the details aren't going to matter that much. When you don't have that, all the details in the world aren't going to fix it. Yeah. 
you know, we can't go around forcing the American Constitution on the world saying, if you only had this, you'd have a great nation. We actually tried that. That was tried in, in South times. America and yeah. Mexico and even in Russia at one and point. Africa. Yeah. And it just doesn't work mm -hmm. because we have a different moral and religious history than the rest of the world. And it's ceasing to work in our nation now. Mm -hmm. So the Bible solutions are never political. And yet we need politics. But there's so many warnings. And we keep, in, the, in these dark days, we keep hearing, put not your confidence in princes. Hmm. It's a good reminder. Mm -hmm. Yes. The Bible has things to say about civil government, but it never, ever suggests that that's the way of salvation. And that if we only had the right rulers and the right laws, they'd fix everything. What we need is a new people. What we need is Christ enthroned in the hearts of a people. We need the coming of the kingdom of God. Can we get that to happen if we just vote hard enough? Yeah, we vote <laughs> hard enough. Yeah, educate voters and and cover all the conspiracies against America and against Christianity. And when people realize all that, then they'll vote right. And then everything, the new age will die. Uh, I think it's Bob Murphy who says it, but he basically asks the question, you know, from people on both sides, they basically say like, you need to get out there and vote. Like if you don't vote, you're, you, you're, you hate your country and all this kind of stuff. And the question is basically, do you think that the quality of the election output is increased by encouraging people who don't look into any of the candidates and just vote the party line? <laughs> More yeah, people voting do doesn't mean the democracy is better now. <laughs> I always feel a little bit proud of myself when I skip over certain races like, oh, I didn't actually do any research on that one. I'm not going to vote. Like, That's doing my civic duty. <laughs> It's interesting. I do that, but pride is not exactly what I feel at that point. <laughs> it's more of a, oh, well, I don't have time for that one. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's not enough to vote. It's not enough to vote the party line. It's not, I mean, this is a discussion probably for another time. I'm just going to throw this out. Maybe you, you two have reactions to it. The Bible does tell us that we should want and choose men who fear God and who are honest. What if we pretty well know that none of the candidates on the ballot really meet those most basic qualifications? I, I, I think the answer depends on what you expect out of the outcome. If you really expect that we are the people of God and that we really deserve to have godly rulers, then, then probably you shouldn't vote for anybody and wait for the next election to get a better slate of candidates. Um, if you realize we're under the judgment of God, <laughs> And, and God is giving us a chance to pick maybe, possibly, not for sure, a lesser form of judgment, then maybe it's okay to vote the lesser of two evils. The, the assumption that we are under God's blessing and that we have the ability to follow through with obedience when we haven't been obeying God in every major area for a couple hundred years is presumption in the extreme. And, and it's a sort of legalism. If I just top dot all of my I's and cross all of my T's, then God will be required to bless me and my mm -hmm. nation. Yeah, no, he won't actually at all. Obedience, covenant faithfulness is a lot bigger than that. And it begins with the gospel. And fact never departs from the gospel. If you're not walking with Jesus in the day-to-day -day existential relationship, if he's not your Lord and Savior all the time, then all of your wanted political activities God's going to use them, but he may not at least use them the way that you think he is. Mm -hmm. He most likely will give us exactly what we deserve. Although because he's so gracious, sometimes he doesn't. And that's <laughs> what's really amazing. Why, why isn't everybody in the American system a little version of Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin right now? We deserve it. But God is merciful. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Even in um, our greatest moments, why don't we deserve that in the first place? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, w one thing that we've already talked about is mentioned passing as we, as we kind of move on. Well, two things, actually. One we've talked about. Israel didn't have a prison system. Mm -hmm. and, and when people hear the nature of the system of punishment, they generally are revolted. First of all, restitution. And some people will say, yay, particularly if they've been robbed from. <laughs> but other will, others, as we've seen, will say, well, that's not fair. Yeah, it's like putting people in prison. That really helps everybody, doesn't it? <laughs> Whipping. Oh, no, that's brutal. And putting people in jail for 20 years where they can 
be homosexually raped, abused, terrorized. That's so much more humane. No, we're going, no, better yet, we'll rehabilitate them. See previous podcasts <laughs> on that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, whipping hurts. And it's over. It's over in a day and you're back with your family in your job. And probably you won't want to do that anymore. And there's a limit to how much you can And there's whipped. a limit. There is a limit. Mm -hmm. uh, execution. Again, we, we've rejected the death penalty out of hand because it's it's cruel and unusual. I think um, it's interesting how the death penalty is also decentralized in Israel's law, mm -hmm. that you have the avenger of blood, the person who is responsible. Nobody else can, you know, say they're going to take vengeance. It's There's one specific person whose job it is. And maybe they're allowed to hire help. I don't know. But <laughs> no, there's no, they actually were. someone but responsible. That, yeah, those were, but that was for, um, those were for cases that were, not clearly what we would call first degree murder cases. Right. Yeah. Those are the appeal, accidental deaths. Yeah. An appeal could be made. No, it was an accident uh, where there was actually a crowd standing around, two or three witnesses. They saw the thing, they saw it unfold. They could describe the wrath, the anger, they could, or the, uh, enough evidence to show premeditation. That didn't go through the Avenger of Blood, that would go through the court system. Mm -hmm. But uh, speaking of decentralization, if you were going to be a witness in such a thing, you had to throw the first stone. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe we don't want to use stoning, but we you know, be the first to throw the switch or have a series of switches. And and the, the witnesses throw the first few and the judge wow. throws the last one. And there, there are things you could do here that would be consistent with if you're going to bear witness against someone's life, you're, you're all in. You can't you can't just say it and walk away and let other people do your dirty work. You have to be personally involved, as does the court, as does the judge. The judge can't just sign a paper and go off and fish. He needs to be there and see this happen. And it needs to be open and public. So again, it can't be pushed away into some dark corner where we are assured that everything happened quiet and civilly. The torture is right out in Israel. No torture allowed under any circumstances. The other thing that... Um, people will balk at as penal service. But again, we have prison service. People are in prison doing nothing in particular except being terrorized or being terrorizers, and we're okay with that. But having someone live and work with a family for X number of years in a productive way to regain capital and pay back a debt, that sounds too much like slavery. Well, look at the prison system. That's slavery. <laughs> it really is. I mean, you, you, you put a person in a place he doesn't want to be and keep him there and make him to live in a particular way he doesn't want to do. That's, that's what we call slavery. Mm -hmm. But we're okay with it because we're used to it and because we don't call it that anymore. But the um, 14th Amendment is very specific. It forbade, um, well, what's the word? Not penal service. They have another word for it. But uh, basically that, invol involuntary servitude, mm -hmm. uh, except in cases of civil punishment. In other words, prisons. So the 14th Amendment did not undo, or so the 13th, 13th ended slavery, 14th granted civil rights, and so on. So between the two, the, 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 there was this, still this recognition. We have slavery. We just don't call it that. Mm -hmm. But we have, in America, learned to respond to word triggers. You call it this, it's okay. You call it that. And all hell breaks loose. Uh, Lewis said something like that in uh, That Hideous Strength. Call it, uh, don't we, we mustn't experiment on children, but give them a free education in an experimental school, and it's all right and great, hmm. and so on. Hmm. And then the last thing is charity. The civil, the civil laws in Israel provide for charity, but they don't force it. It's sort of a, here's what you should be doing. And if you're not doing it, your neighbors are going to notice and your church elders may have words with you, but there's no clear civil punishment nor extensive civil leg legislation. For instance, there were the gleaning laws. You, you, this applied, obviously, to where there's agriculture going on. You got a field. You harvested stuff. Don't try to get it all. Don't go back and get what you forgot. Leave it so that the poor can come in and work and pay their way through life rather than simply take free handouts. On the other hand, there was the third year tithe. Every third year, the whole tithe went local to people you knew who were poor and um, it was free. Now, if you're just you know down on your luck as it were, that can capitalize you to start a business to get back on your feet. On the other hand, 
you really can't work, then you're going to have to figure out how to spread that out over the next couple of years and be a wise administrator of these funds you've been entrusted with, because it's not going to be there every single day. You have to learn to, well, what is the word when you're careful with your money? Frugal, mm -hmm. that. And, and then the law encouraged non-interest um, non loans for poor people, which would um, be canceled ever at the end of every six year in the Sabbath year. So there were lots of things the Bible did to encourage uh, care for the poor, but it didn't mandate that the civil government had to go around and check that people were doing it. God simply said, and if you don't, I'll make sure that your wives become widows and your children become orphans because this is the way the system works. And it was more of a religious commitment than a political imposition. And I'm sure there are things we've left out and things we could talk about, but in broad strokes, that's, that's Israel's theocracy. And as I said at the beginning, yeah, it's awful libertarian compared <laughs> to anything the world has ever known. Mm -hmm. Very limited in, in what it requires. And, and yet... Uh, from the oh, late 70s on, since the rise of the religious right and the death of the religious right, there was this great fear that uh, conser Christian conservatives are going to take over the country, turn into the theocracy, and kill all of their uh, opposition. No. <laughs> no, we, that was never really on anybody's agenda. Mostly it was scale down civil government uh, you stop abortion, maybe toughen up some drug laws, take a second look at capital punishment for murderers, um, compel Christianity? No. <laughs> Can't teach do it that. As the doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, teach it as the religion of the, of the land? No. Maybe allow creation to be taught as an alternative hypothesis in public schools? More likely they should get rid of the public schools and throw it back on the free market. Yeah. Um, See also episode 50. Yeah. Um, you, Emily posted, and, I, I, and for our audience, I never know what Emily's going to post as a meme until I see it. So I'm always excited to look. And some that of them also I means asked, he's not responsible for it. it if you're going to be mad at it, be mad at me. <laughs> and, and some of them I look at, there's one that you're still going to have to explain to me that I don't understand. Oh, okay. Um, we talk, we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> but I did appreciate this one of the last ones you put up where you, the uh, evangelical church is embodied yeah. in someone who I don't recognize, but probably should. And he turns and shoots something that's what labeled God's law or something like that. And then turns and says, I don't understand why, what, what you know. What's wrong with about. America or something. It, yeah. What he shot was uh, God's law as the moral authority or the standard of morality in America. And then you he know. turns to the camera and says, I can't imagine what's wrong with America. Mm. Something like that. I would, I would like to jump off of that and, and say it's what we've been talking about. It's easy to look at the pagan world, look at unbelievers, look at humanism and say they reject God's law and they get what they deserve. But the truth is that the church for a long time has been doing the same thing. We acknowledge God's authority over our private lives and our consciences, at least to some extent. But when we look at the world beyond us, we in good American fashion say, well, they never voted for God, so they really shouldn't have to obey him, uh, nor should we force our religion on them without clearly understanding that every law code is the uh, formalization of a religion. It's religion uh, brought down to legal terms. Every, every law code says there's a God behind this that says thou shalt and thou shalt not. And as Christians look at the Bible, they, for a long time now, have been afraid, generally, of imposing it on other people. Because again, First Amendment, these people aren't Christians. We can't force them to act like Christians. Forgetting that God does own the world. Uh, that Jesus does have all power in heaven and earth. But then secondly, and, and far worse, is we look at ourselves and say, yeah, law, that's an Old Testament thing. Mm -hmm. And all those weird, quirky laws about restitution and and, and penal service and two or three witnesses, that's stoning maybe people. It's interesting. Stoning people, yeah, that's all that about. That's old-fashioned and kind of brutal and barbaric and whatever it may have been once. It might have been okay for those people, although we don't understand what God was up to. 
God obviously has grown up and gotten nicer and clearer and cleaner and, and more direct. And what he wants is to have his spirit in our heart leading us to do the loving thing. Which leaves us with a question of, in general, how should we treat murderers, child molesters, pedophiles? What Does God have a solution? Are these things even wrong as far as God's concerned? And if they're wrong, then surely hasn't God told us how wrong they are? I mean, do they deserve a, a swat, a slap on the wrist, a fine? How, how do we know what God thinks of them and with what severity we may properly respond without ourselves becoming wicked, sinful, tyrannical? And where exactly are we going to find this? Uh, it would, on the one hand, it would certainly be a mistake to take the Old Testament case laws, the Book of the Covenant and all of that, and cut and paste it into the civil laws of, of uh, modern nations, if only for the, the reason that so many of the, of the case laws are tied in with the tabernacle, the priesthood, the land, and that whole redemptive economy. And yet, on the other hand, Jesus and Paul both quoted from the case laws and used them, Jesus quotes from um, the laws against juvenile delinquency, he that curses the father and mother, let him die the death. Paul, Paul picks the obscure one, <laughs> don't muzzle the ox that treads the corner and applies it to, pa to paying pastors in the church. So obviously there is a use for these things. Now, the church has not done a whole lot in trying to figure it out. Well, but not lately. Not lately. <laughs> <laughs> the Puritans worked on it some. Uh, and the Westminster Standards, if you read the proof texts, did take them seriously as far as the, the general equity of, of them uh, required. That is, what was God getting at? What's What was not uh, redemptively qualified by time and place? And so there, 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 is, there are parts where we can start. Some of the confessions of the Reformation do, do make use of the Older Testament in, in showing us what civil justice would look like. We can at least start there and begin to build. And uh, rather than say, enshrine American tradition as, well, obviously, America is the chief pinnacle of God's workings with men. And if it's not in the American Constitution, it's not Christian. Yeah, well, maybe not. <laughs> maybe maybe the Bible doesn't mention America. That bothers, that bothers Christians a lot that America is not in Bible prophecy. I've actually seen attempts to put I, I America think you've, in Bible you've prophecy. made everyone from my last church mad. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Tell I them to email us. Yeah. <laughs> They're not I, listening. Uh, <laughs> I remember um, this This was obscure, but I'll, just, I'll throw it out as an example. Um, Pat Robertson was doing a panel discussion with with someone who I've apparently had been reading Barry Fell's books on America, B.C., and, and, and so on, what, that argued for an early European presence in America before Columbus. And uh, in the book, it suggests that, for instance, um, uh, the Phoenicians and others had come to America and settled there. And so Pat Robertson latched onto that and said, oh, so in other words, in that time when Ezekiel's writing, America would be, what would become America was actually Phoenician colonies. And he goes down the list of, of nations listed in, um, in Ezekiel during the invasion of Gog and Magog and says, so that's how America appears in prophecy. The only way they knew to, to define it was in terms of the, the, the civilizations who already had colonies in the New World. And so when Gog and Magog invade Israel and the young lions of these nations say, what are you doing? That's really America stepping in and saying, why are you, inter why are you invading Israel? Oh, <laughs> oh my. That, I mean... I mean no. Uh, that that probably was not even worth the discussion. But yeah, no, it's not yeah. remotely. But, uh, you know, when I do timelines, you may remember this when you were in my class. Um, I I don't stop in America. I don't stop in the 20th century. I keep running the timeline as far to the edge of the board as I can. And then usually go dot, dot, dot. <laughs> because it, it matters. If the timeline stops with us. <laughs> then that gives the impression that America is the climax and the fulfillment of all that God's been doing in the history of the world. <laughs> but when you draw it on into the distant future and you see the possibility of thousands of years lying ahead of us and realize America's only been here for a couple hundred, and suddenly 
America doesn't look like a big deal anymore. America will be what God wants it to be. And our side of that is um, uh, the wicked will be turned to hell and all the nations that forget God. We have choices to make as a people. And God's plan doesn't rest on them. Mm -hmm. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. Uh, yeah. I don't want any of God's purposes resting on human hands. <laughs> like We don't do a very good job. No. All right. That is all the time we have for tonight. So let's do some rapid fire recommendations if you have them. Well, I have a question. I can ask a question in lieu of recommendations. Okay. That works. Okay. So I've... Almost finished. I'm a little behind, but I am very close to finishing my reading the Bible in a year plan for the first time in nice. my life. And the problem that I encountered pretty early on is I was trying to stay on schedule, which is pretty accelerated. You know, you could read the Bible faster than a year for sure, but it was faster than I was used to going. And I found that I could not stay on schedule and take all the notes that I wanted to take. Oh, you're not talking about just reading. You're talking about studying. That's a big difference. Okay, that was my question. Like, how do you do both? Um, Where? <laughs> I, I wouldn't try I mean, to study the whole Bible in a year, for one. I was going to say, that's more like, if you want to do two things concurrently, I think the best method would be you do the, the read a Bible in a year, and then you have the first year of a five-year Bible study plan next to it that's uh, happening at yeah. the same time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I read generally two chapters or more, depending, uh, from the Bible every day but Sunday, which is weird. <laughs> uh, but I get through, I generally get to the Bible once in a year. But I'm reading. Now, it helps that I've been reading the Bible now for a long time. Started when I was 16. And most years, except for the first few years of my marriage when I was reinventing my life, um, I did <laughs> that. That does happen. <laughs> you know, you get, you, my wife set a, a very godly example for me because she'd get up in the morning and read her Bible. And I was used to reading in the evening. And, I, and when I got married, I found off and I was tired and sleepy and didn't do it. So I started imitating her. So that began to get me up in the morning. Setting a schedule is good. Doing it things is. regularly is good. God has made his creatures a habit. And we should build on that and use it. But as far as Bible study is concerned, I think Brian's right. Setting a, a plan of five years sounds eminently reasonable for your first time through. I would I would do your your maybe 15 minutes in the morning and then immediately after supper or sometime, maybe just before, sometime when you're 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 not mentally dead yet. <laughs> you you set aside 15 minutes and you're gonna go a chapter at a time or half a chapter at a time. And um Try something like that. So yeah, that's a good thing. To, that's a good thing. We all collectively recommend Bible reading and Bible study. As two different things. What? As two different things. Connected by a third thing, which is called prayer. <laughs> where we ask God, one, to keep us alert, awake, and focused. And then two, to show us what we need to know from this particular passage and how it relates to the passages. And a third thing that I think will come out of Brian's recommendation eventually as your reading, as your reading goes ahead of your studying, you're going to start encountering other passages mm. that will reflect back on what you're studying. And so your reading and your studying will begin cross illuminating one another. Hmm. And you'll say, I'm in Proverbs. Why does Acts suddenly seem so relevant? <laughs> you know, because we, we tend to think that some books are more connected to some books than to others. And there's some truth in that, but it's all the word of God. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes we do need to say, well, why should you read Romans and Ecclesiastes at the same time? Well, that one I could probably actually answer. Uh, Ezekiel and Isaiah, that one's easy. <laughs> but um, yeah, so these are our recommendations. And although they don't come directly from God, we think he may approve. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much. This has been a great discussion. Yeah. Thanks also to David, our producer and my lawfully wedded husband. I had forgotten to say that for several episodes in a row and was called out. Ooh. So I felt terrible because I hadn't realized that I had stopped saying it. I was always grateful to David in my heart. Um, <laughs> oh! <laughs> what? <laughs> What's funny? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll explain it later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> all right. Well, thank you also to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. If you have thoughts or questions or comments about anything we've said, um, any yeah, just send us your notes. Um, our email address is haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. And you can visit our website uh, if you'd like to join our financial supporters with a recurring monthly gift. That's anchor.fm slash haltingtowardszion. Thanks so much. Hope to see you next week.